Well, it falls right into a pattern of work that I've had uh, since the 1980s. I call it oversight. You know, everybody thinks about Congress legislating, passing bills, repealing laws, appropriating money. Uh, those are all important functions, but a function uh, I like to emphasize is the constitutional role of oversight, which means that you're on top of the executive branch of government uh, to make sure that the laws are faithfully executed according to congressional intent and that money spent according to congressional intent. So I see my role of making sure that, uh, that I'm a check under our Constitution on the executive branch of government, in other words, the pe uh, president's people, whether Republican or Democrat, to make sure they're doing their job right. And in regard to the FDA, one of the impetuses there comes from the fact that the federal government is a buyer of a lot of medical devices and pharmaceutical products. And so uh, I have a responsibility to make sure that what we buy, because the, I'm, I serve on the committee that has jurisdiction over those programs, uh, to make sure that we buy drugs uh, that are safe and effective. And uh, so uh, I, I want you to know that I didn't go just after the FDA to be going after the FDA it falls into a pattern of things that I've been doing with a lot of bureaucracy, first starting with the Defense Department in the 1980s to make sure that money is spent uh, properly. Uh, then where do you get the sources? You know, I don't just uh, decide, well, today, tomorrow uh, it's the FDA, yesterday it was the Department of Defense. Uh, I have people in your profession, enterprising journalists, that maybe write things or come to us with information. Or more often, uh, we have whistleblowers within an organization that want to point out that something's not right, the law is not being followed, the money's being wasted, or special interests have too much influence. So those things have brought me to the F uh, Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. For instance, uh, I think my first uh, was a whistleblower by the, no by the name of Dr. Mushholder who came to me with concerns. He was an employee there. He was a scientist there. Uh, he was not being listened to when he thought that there was too much of a relationship between antipsychotic drugs that uh, young people were taking and young people suicide. So we started looking into that and then we found out that things weren't right. And finally after a, too long of a period of time we at least got the Food and Drug Administration to go back and put uh, black box warnings on those drugs uh, as an example. Now, maybe more should have been done. I'd, at this point, I think that that's satisfactory, but uh, maybe more will need to be done. Or we have a doctor, I think it, the next one was a Dr. Graham involved with Vioxx, and he tended to believe that there was ample evidence once the market, once even before the drug got on the market, that it was going to uh, cause. Uh, other health problems for people taking it. So we ended up listening to him. We ended up having a hearing. You get Vioxx off the market uh, and you know you know the history of that. So you, you ask me how you get into looking at FDA, you kind of slip into it as a process of doing my overall job of constitutional responsibility of oversight. Well, first of all, the Physician Sunshine Act has not been passed by the Congress yet. I hope to get it passed either late this year or early next year. But right now, uh, we're gaining a great deal of, of support, and oddly enough, support from the industry for it. But uh, let me suggest to you that this is a follow-on of what I said about the general oversight of FDA. You get in, involved in this FDA stuff, then you get involved in, in finding out that there's a, a lot of, uh, uh, I can't call a conflict of interest because that's drawing a judgment. I can say that the public ought to be entitled to know whether or not their prescribing doctor might have a relationship, financial, with some company or some trade association. Uh, in the process of, of doing that, you don't have to make a judgment. Uh, now, uh, if something's wrong being done, it's just a case of we're purchasers of drugs 
as a federal government, I ought to know as a supplier of drugs for people that are on government programs, uh, does a certain prescription and the doctor doing it uh, have an implied interest. Uh, uh, and so uh, at this point, the Sunshine Act doesn't make anything that's going on illegal. It just makes the reporting of it because we believe that transparency brings accountability and consumers ought to be able to be educated whether or not the doctor prescribing something may be prescribing it because it's in the best interest of the health of that patient or because that doctor may have a financial connection with a company of the drug that he's prescribing. So uh, we, we want to, now of course you understand medical associations have, uh, have ethics laws that if they would enforce them this wouldn't be an issue. Uh, and maybe they are in force, but it still needs to be an issue as far as the public's concerned, not just as far as the medical association's concerned. So we had three or four states that had passed laws like this. One state has gone far enough to make sure that this information's on the internet. It ought to be that way for everybody in the country, so that if Mary Smith in Podunk Center, Missouri, wants to look and see if her doctor's got a financial interest in the drug he's prescribing, that information's out there. I happen to believe that transparency is not only good for uh, consumer protection, but I think uh, transparency brings discipline. And discipline's going to make sure uh, that, uh, that, uh, that doctors are prescribing what that patient ought to have as opposed to any relation to the financial uh, benefit he might have with the company or the trade association. Well, it's as simple as enforcing existing law because the NIH uh, regulations and law require that, that the universities make sure that any researcher that's on their staff gets information from that researcher of any financial arrangements he's got with any company that he's doing research for or any company that's supporting his research, how they benefit financially from it. Ought to be public information. The re universities have a responsibility to collect it. We have found in our investigations that universities uh, uh, are not doing an adequate job of collecting it. Supposed to be doing. The universities make sure that their uh, staff is doing what they're supposed to be doing, and NIH is not doing a very good job of that. Uh, and uh, I w they're suggesting us they got to change rules and regulations to do it. They don't have to do that. Uh, I, I, I'm telling you that if they would not grant a grant that was applied for because of some lack of reporting, or if they withdraw a grant from a university uh, that wasn't doing its job of collecting this information, the word would get out very, very fast. You better make sure that you are collecting this information the way you're supposed to. I, I can't review what's transpired specifically as far as university and doctors are concerned but I can speak generally about it, that we've gone to uh, th the records and we have found that a university had uh, one set of figures that was reported, uh, a researcher was reporting another set of figures and an incomplete set of figures and just clear cut uh, that, that there was not accurate reporting or full reporting and that the university was not really policing the operation the way they should. And it happens it was in psychiatry, but it could have been in anything. 